We are here at the, oh my gosh, this massive, amazing Picasso painting with Larissa Bailiff. Thank you so much for your time to tell us about this amazing painting. You're welcome, Nate. And as you said, it's really, really large scale. I mean, it's the size of an old master painting. And I think, you know, when we look at it in a book or in slides, we might not get a sense of oh, scale, no. which is really important for this. It's an ambitious work that Picasso created in 1921. <laughs> This episode is funded by the Glick Fund and the Crystal Hahn Family Foundation, who inspire philanthropy and creativity. Well, yeah, so tell me, what, what led him to create, I mean, this type of work? What kind of, what would you define this as as well? This is a work we would call a cubist work, and even more specifically, a synthetic cubist work. So this is kind of a movement that Picasso spearheaded with a fellow innovator, mm. um, George Brock. And they were living in France, although Picasso is a Spanish painter, and they were working through forms of abstraction and breaking down form and reconstructing it. With synthetic cubism, it's just that. It's a synthesis, and it started when Picasso and Brock began cutting up paper and sticking forms together. Now, this is a painted work. It's not cut up paper, but it carries through an idea that they'd been playing with for several years. What's going on here? Like, what's the subject itself? I mean, the R3 musician, do they represent something? Right, and I'm saying it as if we can absolutely read what's going on, right? It's three musicians, that's right. the title. So, you know, I think given that it helps us sort of locate things, and I think we can tell that there are forms of figures, but part of cubism is that it's a bit of a puzzle. So there are three figures there, and in fact, it's a self-portrait of Picasso. Again, I act like you can recognize him, right? He's these strange forms put together, but he often showed himself in the costume of what we call a Harlequin figure, a figure wearing kind of diamond pattern. Mm. And so I know that's Picasso. And he's put two figures, he's flanked by two figures who um, are also in disguise or costume, and they're friends of his. And then the colors, now that looks very familiar. I mean, are those kind of from where he's from? I mean, did, what, why choose those really bright orange Absolutely. colors? Absolutely. So um, Picasso is thinking about his heritage and having come from Spain. Those colors are based on uh, the colors of the Spanish flag. He's translated them a little bit, but he's, oh, he's put okay. that in there to assert his okay. Spanishness. And also the guitar is believed to have been perhaps invented in Spain. So although he never played the guitar, he shows himself strumming a guitar and asserting that sense of um, national identity. Yeah, the guitar reminds me of uh, in the Blue Perry piece where he's got the guitarist, you know, just laying on the street. Absolutely. Like. Interestingly enough, we think that Picasso um, didn't really like listening to music very much. He not only didn't play it, but um, some of his friends said he would get bored during performances. That's so funny now, because I did know, did he do anything with theater? I think you're really picking up on um, a lot of what's going on in this picture here. Not only are these figures in disguise, but he's alluding to um, theatrical performances mm. and um, particular troops called Commedia del Arte, which have a long tradition of hundreds of years, and by this time were performing in um, Paris and he could see them. He also did set designs and costumes um, for the Ballet Russe. So I know that, you know, before this, he was, like you said, blue period, and then after this, I think surrealism. I mean, why did he go all over the board so often? Right, so we can call these periods, sometimes we add isms mm -hmm. to these movements or um, periods of his career. One of the threads that runs throughout is that he's constantly innovating. He's constantly pushing modern art. And he lived an incredibly long life, and he was innovating the entire time. Yeah, and I believe that he, I think he even said that as long as he kept painting, he's like, I won't die. <laughs> well, you know, he it, what, worked 91, so it worked for him. It worked for him, and he was creating art until the very end. Quick question for you, too. I don't know if this is connected, but I know he always had a desire to think like a child, to get back to that root of, I mean, is this kind of all on the path of that? I love that you bring that up, and again, I think it's something that he returned to. You know, he said, I want to look through the eyes of a child, and that, you know, children create the best art, and um, I'm paraphrasing, but, but this was really an important thing for him. And I think that sometimes it manifests itself in looking like it was created by a child. If we think about cutting up paper and creating collage, you know, he's taking something that children can do and, and taking it to another level. At this very same time, in 1921, this was created in the summer, he's creating works that are much more what we would call realistic or naturalistic. 
um, and he can work in both modes, and he's interested in working in both modes, and showing off that he can work in both modes. Yeah, he was a little proud. <laughs> a little proud. He's yeah. in, do you I see that he's, he's in the center of the picture? Yeah, which I, it, I would say, a good artist, it's that fine line between cocky and confident, and he was right on it. <laughs> exactly, exactly. You know, we've mentioned three figures in this picture. I want you to look around and see if there's another figure. Oh, I th is it, I see the tail, is it maybe a dog down there? Exactly. Or, so why, why the dog? Right, why the dog? Well, first I want to just make sure that everybody can see it because it, oh, I see top, its head. It's it way back sort of there. becomes almost a cut out shape. And when I first saw this painting, I too saw the tail and I thought, what is that? And I had to sort of reconnect and I thought, is that a rug? He's playing with us like he does throughout the picture. Picasso loved animals and he had animals throughout his life, and right. including a number of dogs um, that were really important to him. Well, and something that you're kind of reminding me of, I mean, the scale, this is why I love being in the museum. The scale is just enormous. Like, I had no idea how big it was. But then you've got the little hands. So, I mean, he really was playing with it. He's, he's really playing with it. And I think there's a contrast, too, because when I look at this picture, I see joy and I also maybe see sorrow. I'm, I'm confused in a wonderful way by the dark tones mm -hmm. and the light tones and the big, bulky figures. They're monumental. And yet, the that playful scale of the hands. I mean, how could that possibly hold that sheet music or play that guitar? It's so childlike, but then he is so consistent about contrasting. I mean, my eye does such a good job of moving around to all the different areas. So yeah. he, he knew what he's, he, he could throw exactly down. He knew exactly what he could throw down. He knew exactly what he was doing. Well, thank you so much uh, for taking some time to, wow, point out some amazing features of this painting, Larissa. Thanks for sharing it with me, Nate. Hey everybody, thanks so much for tuning in. If you would like to get some more Outrageous episodes, simply click on the right, and over on the left, you got to subscribe. And I would absolutely love to connect with you on Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter. You can find me using at OutrageousNate. Hey, everybody out there, have a great day and be outrageous.